Today is day 24, and I'm reading from Genesis 35 through 37. Jacob returns to Bethel. Now, this is a significant word or name, Bethel, because it is here where God originally visited Jacob. And remember that he had the angelic visitation and it left a lasting impression upon him. And even though he left from there and was still the same old Jacob, it was the seed that was sown in his heart that would set the stage for a changed man. And here he comes full circle back. He enters and he's become the courageous leader now and he challenges his family. And he says to them, using the words, purify yourselves, get rid of all of these pagan type gods. And uh, he built an altar there. Now it's significant because the first time he went, he built a pillar. And that was more of a paganistic approach to many gods. This time he's building an altar to the one true God. And uh, there's a heart change here. And you can see it in the language and you, and you recognize it in the way that he's leading his family. Rachel dies giving birth to Benjamin. The 12 children um, of Israel that will become the, the tribe, the 12 tribes of Israel, it's a dysfunctional bunch of characters, isn't it? But don't lose hope. It gives us an aspiration of recognizing that God can use anybody. And though the process may be long and the refining it process may be drawn out, God is able to take that which we consider unuseful and turn it for his honor and glory. In chapter 36, <clears throat> indeed, God prospers both Jacob and Esau, even as he promised. And so both of them are prospering to such an extent that the land cannot contain them and they have to part ways. In chapter 37, we're introduced to the spoiled favorite son of Jacob, Joseph, and he is favored. <clears throat> it's the love of his life, Rachel's second or first son, and uh, his brothers hate him because they know that he has, that he's spoiled and that he's a favorite one. <clears throat> and so they see him wearing this beautiful robe of many colors and they despise him all the more. He seems to enjoy bringing a bad report about his siblings and this only deepens the animosity between all of them. He loves sharing his dreams that he has with his brothers. He talks about sheaves and all these sheaves bowing down to him. <clears throat> they talk about the stars. He talks about the stars and the stars bowing down to him. Of course, they recognize that he's insinuating that one day they are going to bow down to him. It is a divine dream, but Joseph has a lot to learn and God is going to humble this boy and use him in a remarkable way. Upon hearing his brothers ask, shall you indeed rule over us? His father rebukes Joseph, but he kept the matter in his heart. So something in Jacob resonated because he's reminded of the rough character that he was and the visitation he had at Bethel and how God could turn a man, Jacob, into a man, Israel, prince with God. And so he did not put it past what God may have planted in his son Joseph's heart. Jacob sends Joseph to check on his uh, other children. <clears throat> they see him coming. Their hatred is hot and they're intending to kill him. He is remarkably saved by Reuben, who also is not the most holy person that's out there, demonstrating that God can use anyone to accomplish his purposes. Joseph uh, is, uh, <clears throat> in, this case, in this fashion here, uh, is uh, sold. He's on his way to Egypt. Uh, he's gonna serve uh, for, he's being prepared for divine preparations, but all of it looks hopeless. Uh, the deceit continues as his brothers concoct a story to deceive their father that he's been possibly killed by a wild beast. Can you imagine the pain that, the, that Jacob must have felt? And ugly, as ugly as it seems and as awful as it looks, 
God is in full control and his plans has, have been activated in Joseph and the outcome will be miraculous.